to Take a Wonder with Shebs with your host, Shebs from Shebs the Wanderer. Now my guest today is David Allen. David and I have got to know each other through a Twitter chat called TRLT run by Shane Dallas. And of course, he's been on my show before. Uh, we discussed about some of his times away. He's also traveled through the pandemic as well. So I also discussed with David about the current situation he is in right now, as he was meant to be in China, his love for photography and much more. So sit back and enjoy. Thank you very much for coming on, David. I really appreciate your time. How have you been? Yeah, really good. Um, you know, obviously lockdown, strange times at the moment for everyone. But um, yeah, it's been OK for me personally. Um, and then we're, we're about to say you based. So I'm living in Hereford at the moment uh, with my mother-in-law and Mrs. Plane Ticket away as well. So we were living in China until January and then we flew back uh, for a couple of week holiday. And then we got kind of we were delaying going back. We were due to go back to Shenzhen. Um, but we, we, we kind of delayed going back and then they closed the borders on us. So um, so we've been stuck out of China. We could go back now, but we, we don't want to at the moment. All right, so your actual uh, permanent residency is in China? Uh, well, we've been teaching out there as TEFL teachers, so teaching English as a foreign language. So we were teaching uh, last year from last March until, uh, until January this year in just outside Shanghai in a university just outside Shanghai. And then we, we changed jobs. Uh, we were going to start a new job down in Shenzhen, right next to Hong Kong. Um, but obviously we didn't, we haven't actually managed to start. We signed the contract and everything, but we haven't actually done any teaching there yet. I know you said you could go back now, but is the plan definitely still to go back when? Um... Yeah, so um, we still want to go and live there for a year, really in Shenzhen and, and have that access to Hong Kong and Macau and Guangzhou. And we've still got lots of places to visit in China we want to visit and, and, and get the cheap flights around, around Southeast Asia as well and to Taiwan and to Japan and visit all these places as well. Where, where did travel then begin? Was it, was it partly because of jobs or was it prior to that? Were you always interested in traveling? Oh, I think I've always been interested in it. Um, so I remember getting one Christmas, getting a globe from my parents uh, and I was pestering my father. Uh, he was trying to get rid of me whilst he tried to I don't know, deal with one of my brothers or something. And um, so he kept naming countries on and, and telling me to go and find it on the globe. So and I distinctly remember Mongolia being one of them. So I, oh, I thought, like, I've always known about Mongolia ever since since then. And then obviously watched things like Michael Palin uh, around the world mm -hmm. in 80 days and the full circle and pole to pole. Definitely those got interested in. So I've always, I think I've always had that interest in travel and adventure. Did you go away with your parents when you were young or was it more sort of when you were older? Uh, so the first time we went away was, uh, I was 18 months old and we went to Ibiza. But I don't remember any of that trip. Um, so we never went abroad again ever since. So uh, as a child, we never went abroad. Um, uh, I went on a couple of school trips, I think to France and one to Holland. Um, but um, both of those were by coach. Um, so the third time I flew, I actually flew the plane because I went and did an experience day flying a, a small Cessna plane out over the M3. And uh, but then I went on a few little trips when I was at university to Amsterdam. I went twice to Amsterdam on university trips. And um, yeah, so I thought, and then we went to Barcelona as well. Was it, was it, was there a transformative moment then when you thought, oh, this is, I really love doing this. I want to do more and more of exploring the world, finding out about different cultures. Is it what, I mean, what, what that question. So what, what was your transformative moment and what would you now travel for? Is it culture? Is it, uh, surroundings uh, what, what is it that you travel for now well, that's a good question um, yeah it's uh, it, it was a little bit it wasn't really I wouldn't say it's a transport it was small incremental steps rather than one big change that said I want to go and travel but um, when I was at university I stayed in um, Hosa residence and there was a guy there who'd done rally international uh, volunteering with rally, rally international um, uh, and he kind of opened up my eyes actually there are these opportunities out there that I could go and do and um so yeah that, that's that's to do and uh, I had a, an internship in, with B&Q in their head office and it was pretty soul destroying working in this um porter cabin in 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 the middle of a car park in their head office uh and it was day in day out and I, I kind of realized I didn't want to do that corporate life any any anymore uh, 
Um, so that was definitely a, a moment where I decided I didn't want to do that corporate life. I wanted to go and explore the world and, 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 and do something different, do something a bit more interesting. So now with, you said obviously teaching abroad uh, English, um, you can go with that quality because I actually did the TEFL course myself actually many years ago, about seven years ago. In fact, I was meant to be going to China in it was early 14. Uh, but what I did the course as a way of, of traveling to different countries and teaching English as a. Um, so, is your plan, was your, is your plan really to move around after you've done a bit of China and explore more other, other countries and teach other, in other, other countries, as you say? Yeah, so um, from 2009 to 2016, I actually had my own business. I started my own shop. Um, and when I was doing that, I was uh, I managed to get away here and there for a couple of weeks at a time. But um, there was I spent three weeks in the Philippines and I was on in Boracay, I think. And I was looking on my phone at the CCTV on the live footage of uh, the, what was happening in the shop back in back in Cheltenham, where I was living at the time. And uh I kind of decided that I can't really travel properly how I'd want to travel. So we kind of decided at that point that I'd sell the shop and we'd go and we'd, we want to go to Africa. So we, we, we did that. Um, when then I think when it was in the Africa, in Africa, uh, my uh, girlfriend, Ellie, she, she saw uh, an article about someone doing teaching English as a foreign language. And we thought, well, that'd be perfect. We both got degrees. Um, we just need to go and do the CELTA course. So when we came back, uh, we, we saved up a bit of money and did the Celta course and then decided to go to China and, and work there for a bit. All right. And you just mentioned Africa there. So uh, just before I go into your Celta course, so uh, how long were you out in Africa for then? Uh, so we did one, uh, one trip in August 2017 for about two and a half months. So we went to Rwanda and Tanzania and Zanzibar. Uh, and we went into... Uh, DR Congo as well for a couple of days just just on uh, to climb um, a volcano called Naira Congo I don't know if you've heard of it it's got the world's largest lava lake um, and it's, pr it's pretty spectacular site it's one of the best things we've done in our travel uh, travel life and my girlfriend she's really into gorilla so we went gorilla trekking in Rwanda as well uh, so we were there for two and a half months and then we came back for about two months and then we drove from the UK to Benin in West Africa as well oh wow so you got a bit of a connection to africa then i because rwanda was a place actually i was planning to go planning to go to this year uh it was actually back in september but it didn't quite happen um so i was planning to do rwanda kenya rwanda um where else a couple of other places i had yeah. Tanzania as well, actually, it was on the list yeah yeah i also wanted to see the you know the gorillas was high on my list actually when i was looking at it back in january i know the prices were you know extortionately high like a thousand i think it was like a thousand dollars for an hour or something or fifteen hundred dollars an hour which is quite expensive um uh, uh, just to see that um, but then i, I thought it'd be, be be worth it but now i looked at it actually um obviously you still you can't go into those countries at the moment but you know i reckon it'll be fairly cheap if, if they didn't open up the borders it might be uh we found rwanda uh, the hotels or accommodation wasn't cheap they're not really set up for budget travelers at all um it's a it's really easy to get around uh we found an airbnb was our, probably our best accommodation but it wasn't it was not it's not great value for money the accommodation wise um they're either really high-end really expensive or even a low end it's still really expensive we stayed yeah. in a couple of brothels do, so. do you think that is because the, the, you don't get as many you don't get really many backpackers down that end do you really it's um it's not renowned for for, for budget traveling is it because I, I the time i went to africa I, I found it quite expensive i thought my goodness you know you can't find anything really cheap here you know uh, but there's not many many international tourists that go down that and I was looking at I know the statistic because when I started working with the radio 77 million uh, visitors uh, this is pre-COVID of course uh, 77 million a year and then Europe gets something like 780 million a year so I mean you've got the <laughs> that that is a huge amount of, I mean the disparity is just ridiculous so I, obviously there's misconceptions about Africa you know being dangerous this and that uh, but every time, obviously, you've been, you know, 
twice drove back down you know it's um i think it's amazing and it's incredibly safe we we found it found it, in, it really really safe um the tra- even even the roads is well organized there's very little bribery in rwanda um but it's well organized when someone says they're going to do something they will do it it's um and you haven't got to worry about that at all and just walking around they're not because they don't get that many independent tourists there in Rwanda, it, they tend to aim for the high-end uh, market, the more expensive high-end people who go in for the gorilla and then maybe a, a week somewhere else in, in uh, one of the game parks they're trying to develop in the east of the country. Would you consider going there after? Because I know you talked about your starter course, which is that that course can take you anywhere. Would, would you go to Africa maybe after China or is it? Um... Um, I'm not sure what the project, what, what the plan is now. Obviously, Covid has set us back a year or so on our plans. So we talked about going to South America because we haven't we haven't actually been to South America, the continent. So um, we talked about going there, maybe teaching. But uh, we talked about going to the Middle East. We both love. We like every time we go to the Middle East, we always love it. So um, we really like the culture and the weather. Amazing there as well. And um, so I, I really don't know because we're kind of Covid's put a. I'm not, I'm not trying to plan too far in advance. People that don't know this sort of course, uh, I don't know if there is a version of it anywhere else around the world. I know in the UK you do this sort of course or you do a TEFL course and they're not cheap either. They're like in the thousands, um, but it allows you to travel the world and teach English as, as a second, uh, as a foreign language, as I say, sorry. And um, I mean, I did the TEFL, uh, I think it was like level advanced two or something. Uh, which allowed me to, and I did, I remember teaching in this country actually for, during the weekends in a Chinese school. <laughs> um, and it was quite, quite interesting actually. I had a mentor there who was telling me that these parents are, I, had, I never heard of the phrase tiger mom before. I was like, tiger mom, what, what is a tiger mom? And it's like, you know, moms that like, you know, forcibly, well, not forcibly, I don't want to use that word, but will send their kids and this is, this is your curriculum, you, you learn English. You go to piano lesson, then you do football or tennis or whatever, and that's your life every day for the rest of the week. And it's like, wow, so, okay, so then there's what they call tiger moms. Is that like, yeah, yeah? There's it goes around, but then a lot of parents are like that, I think, these days, aren't they? Where they, you know, very structured with their kids and stuff. So it's not just Chinese people, I think, anyway. No, I think I think in the Southeast Asia, a, a career as well. They got that culture of pushing their children to do activities, and it's certainly going on in China. You know, when you got one point four billion people to, you're competing for jobs against, you've got to be a little bit pushy and a little bit motivated to get those jobs, really, and and to try and push yourself. So the, the parents are definitely the tiger mum is definitely a, a thing there in China. You've been travelling during the pandemic um and you went to turkey like i did as well um so firstly h- how did you find turkey amazing place so really uh, we've been to istanbul a couple of times and every time we go there we always we really like istanbul as a city i think it's an amazing city uh and uh, we went to ishmi and kushadasi and that area and uh you know there's a lot of history there so we, we really liked it in in terms of covid um I was a bit, in Kushadasi, there, there was a lot more tourists and they weren't, they weren't really wearing their masks as much. When we went to Ishmir, we found, you know, 90% of people, 95% of people were wearing their masks. But in the, in the tourist areas in Kushadasi, we found the mask levels dropped. Um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, I didn't go to Kushadasi, I did go to Ishmir and um, I found, I mean, my journey was through the entire country, like all the way to the southeast, like to places like Mardin, San Lufa, and all those places respected the uh, the social distance rule, you know, the masks and stuff. And I think the police, there's quite a lot of police on the roads, actually, um, telling you to, if, if you didn't wear the mask, you, know, you had to wear the mask and stuff. But um, I, what I mean is, uh, did you, I, I found it, very safe. I mean, I didn't feel as though I was going to get COVID at any point. You know, I mean, I've, I've tested, by the way, since I've come back and, you know, it was negative. Um, so I kept, I was very responsible in what I did. So even like the coaches, I, I use coaches to travel through everywhere. I found that, you know, you were sat on your own if you're solo traveling. Um, I mean, the planes, the only thing with the planes was, you know, they, I understand as well, by the way, it's a commercial, you know, they're there to make money. Uh, so the the middle seats 
weren't free you know they, they did have someone in there uh, but you had to wear the mask. So, um, and then the statistics I've read on that since I came back, when I, when I came back, I read the statistics that was like out of 32 million people that have boarded an airplane, um, only 44 people have, have had COVID or known to have COVID. So the numbers aren't, uh, so there's a bit of a, a, there's a slight myth. And there's, there's a lot of, um, the reason why I asked you about the traveling during covid was there's been a lot of um travel shaming and um it's starting to uh annoy me a little bit because i had a lot of, of travel shaming thrown at my saying you know, at my end saying why did you travel during the pandemic you know how silly can you be but i, I look at it as a if, if other industries are opening up their businesses you know slowly you know you look at the travel industry you obviously travel yourself during this pandemic you know, they've made measures, you know, cleaning measures. Um, you've got the likes of the air host, air hostess. So, you know, they're making sure that no one's going to be, get, so they're being extra careful. Sure, they don't want to get the COVID either and they don't want to be known for an airline, you know. So there's a bit of um, reputation in ha and the, all the airports, toilets, everything is so super clean. So why would you neglect an industry where, it not does it doesn't just mean oh you're going on holiday and enjoying yourself it goes with like turkey you know there's people there if you don't go to an area like i went to no tourists they don't get fed you know that this it affects the business and not just that there's countries all around the world i've got friends in certain places around the world struggling you know they asking for money and you know embarrassingly asking for, you know they're going I'm really I feel really embarrassed to ask you but I'm really struggling <laughs> so it's not just oh yeah you know you're going traveling how, how selfish can you be it's more like oh actually if you don't think of it as 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 a, you think of it as a journey my, my my aim was by the way to document this and sort of um, show people that you can travel safely uh, but other people you know who, who aren't doing that you can absolutely travel safely. There's no, um, there's no harm uh, in doing so. You know, as long as you abide by the rules of those countries, I, I haven't got a problem with traveling. Um, it, it's when people maybe try and circumnavigate uh, the rules by using loopholes or, um, you know, I, I quit a, a Facebook page because the people on it were, were trying to gleefully kind of um, come up with loopholes to get around the travel, the various travel bans. And that's something which I didn't agree with. That was not something which I was comfortable doing with. But I'm quite happy to play by the rules. I may think that some of the rules are idiotic or stupid, but, you know, um, that's the rules that's been set and I'm quite happy to abide by them. And as you said, the, you know, the tourism industry, a lot of these places, I'm thinking about Thailand, uh, the amount of bus drivers, rickshaw drivers, hostel owners, cleaners, bar staff, uh, cafe owners, um, you know, all, all of these people are reliant on a big tourism industry and there isn't going to be the kind of, there's no furlough scheme for them, I, I don't think. So, you know, all, all the, I've um, been reading about Zanzibar, the, the, some of the tourism there has been decimated because there's no, there's no tourists. Um, and there isn't that safety catch, which we've got in the, we're, we're lucky in the Western world to have that kind of, you know. We're very lucky here, you know, uh, people can not go to work and still get paid because the government sort of, you know, yeah. helping them out. But other countries, it isn't, isn't that case, you see. So, you know, what would you do there? You need, you need to be feeding your family. Food on the table needs to be put on there. So what do you do? You know, there's no job. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So it's just, it's, and you know, there are a lot of them would be on hand to mouth. They wouldn't be that they wouldn't have that savings necessarily or the ability to draw on savings from anywhere. So a lot of it's like all day to day basis. And I, 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 a lot of the tourism industry has just been absolutely decimated. And I think about those people when I, when I travel. So when we went to Ishmael and to in the Kushadasi, uh, and when we went to Bulgaria, we try and use like the independent places rather than the rather than the chain places yeah. try and try and drink the local beer or the local coffee or the chai in turkey um and try to use like independent coffee coffee shops and, and and things like that to try and spread what money we do use about yeah actually i, I did the same thing actually so like hotel i mean I, I don't tend to go to big hotels anyway um like the hotels you know 
I made sure I used local hotels, independent ones um, that aren't well known, and you know, it helps them out, and they rec- they need it as well. That you know, it, I mean, it was very cheap as well. Again, just to I mean, I, I could barely spend any money. That's how cheap it was. Um, so I mean, I, I I poured some you know, and also the other thing I was going to make a point on it was that Turkey as a developed is still class as a developing country. You know, they're not. I mean, forty percent I read was reliant on on tourism. You know, income to come in. Uh, they saw it as a country. Well, you know what? Okay, COVID's around. We accept it. We just have to live with it now and do as much precautionary measures as possible. Uh, but we can't afford to, uh, as a nation, have another six months of you know everything being closed. Other countries may be able to. Although, uh, I mean. The UK, I don't know whether another six months of lockdown is going to do us any good. You know, this is what uh, what annoys me sometimes about the because the smaller nations, developing countries, third world country, they they've gone, they go ten steps forward. Something like this happens, they they go thirty steps backwards, and it takes another ten years or whatever to go that ten steps forward again. And guess what? Something else happens, and. They just never seem to get forward. What else would you like to do in the near future when it comes to, I guess, traveling? I know you said South America was on your list. Any other places that that you haven't seen that you would want to go see? Uh, well, yesterday we um, booked a ticket for Bali, actually. So um, I, I really want to go see Komodo dragons. So I know you can get a boat from that uh, is from high Bali. on my list, by the way, to go to to go, to go see the Komodo dragon. Um, yeah. When are you going, by the way? Well, we've booked it for January, but knowing full well that we're going to have to change those dates, I think I don't think there's any chance. Um, is Indonesia open, by the way? Because I looked at Indonesia, I couldn't see them open. I don't think it is. I, I, I've got friends in Bali, and we know that you can't. It's not. It's closed. The borders are closed. Once you leave, you leave, basically. Um, so they wanted to come back in June time, uh, but. Um, Qatar Airways were basically run a competition back in September for teachers. Uh, including ESL teachers. So uh, I got up at two o'clock in the morning and inputted some codes and we won won a ticket. Um, and then we got a 50% off voucher as well for another ticket. So uh, that's what we, we kind of decided. We couldn't decide where, where to go. We had to go somewhere on the, on the Qatar Airways network. So we was looking at going maybe to Bali or Ethiopia or Seychelles or Oman. Um, so I think we decided to go to Bali because I wanted, I really wanted to go and see Komodo dragons, really. So. And when you're not traveling, by the way, do, do, you, do you have any other hobbies? Uh, so we do photography. Uh, we like doing taking photos. We're actually shutter shock uh, contributors. So we sell photos online. Um, most of them are our travel photos, but we have done some photos around here, some stock photography photos. And uh, we like playing board games and walking. So. That's what we mainly do. Photography was something that you did when you were traveling anyway, and it just became part of the part of your hobby. Yeah, I think so. So we started getting more and more into the photography side of things as we traveled. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just something we've developed. You know, we started selling them on, we, we kind of sold a few on Alami, Alami or, um, as well, but not as many. Shutterstock is mostly where we sell them. Uh, we were selling, uh, we've probably taken about $500 out of uh, our account, so uh, from, it helped pay towards going to Cuba at one time. So I know these days the, the smartphones, when I first started traveling, smartphones wasn't around, so you couldn't really take any pictures, so you had to have, a, I guess, a camera. Um, but now the cameras have gone a lot better on the phones, but people think, oh, the, the smartphone cameras are a lot better than the they're not if you, if you know what you're doing they just they'll advertise i mean i saw something the other day on uh on uh, youtube going the the new i you know the, the, i don't want to mention brands actually but the new phone that has got like mm-hmm. eight megapixel uh or 8k whatever and it's like it's still not as good as a camera i trust me it's not as good as a camera <laughs> you just can't get the sort of um the clear picture that you do with no. like, Camera, you see so when i first traveled in 2005 went backpacking around the world i took a film camera i didn't even have a digital camera with me um and uh yeah it was you know digital cameras well, i took a lot more pictures when i had the, i brought i bought one in in new zealand a digital first digital camera and once i did that i started taking a lot more pictures because with the film one i was like oh do i really want to 
have a picture of this forever or not. Um, but one thing that was nice with the film camera is that I left my camera on a table in a communal table in um, in a hostel staying on an island, and they had a, a lot of um, they had some Fijian workers staying there. In, 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 it was in Fiji, and uh, when I came back the next morning, it wasn't the camera wasn't there, and then it turned up like an hour uh, like a day later. And um, so when I got home, I developed the pictures, and they've taken well, the Fijian workers have all taken lots of selfies of themselves and various photos of themselves. So I've got some great photos just <laughs> just from them having the having the camera with them. But, actually, that's, that was, quite, that's quite a nice moment actually having pictures of people. Uh, they didn't realise they would be printed off. So. <laughs> yeah. In terms of when you edit your photos, I mean, because I, I had a conversation with someone in Ishmael actually about, and he was a um, very keen photographer don't you know his wife was they spent thousands of dollars or whatever on, on kits and stuff but they were very, they had a conversation about me about let's just say the sky and uh, so when you edit the sky because i do I, I don't i do minimal edits um might sort of highlight so like get the colors up and or the brightness up but in terms of changing the sky you know going from gray to like sunshine and stuff how how much do you touch your your photos I don't at all. Uh, I don't really use, I don't use Lightroom or Adobe as the two big ones, I think, for yep. post-production. So I know some people have a stock set of backgrounds like skies with certain clouds or moody ones or um, rain. You can add rain and things like that to that. But um, I don't really like those over, over stylized kind of photos personally. Um, but I, I, see, I think it takes something away from the original photo, photo, you know, photograph that you've taken. So you do too much and then it just looks like a, you know, fabricate. what well, it does really. You well, fabricated the entire, doc, you doctored the entire picture and it's like, well, it's not really real, is it? You, you've not taken right. it at the moment where it should be. And a lot of photographers, all school photographers will, timing was, uh, they talk about timing in school. We spoke about, you've got to get the right moments and stuff. Sometimes it can take days, weeks, whatever. And, you know, sunsets and sunrises and stuff, you have to be on there in that moment. So let's just say you put like a sunset or a sunrise and it wasn't a sunset or a sunrise. Well, and you can do that. I know you can do that. Uh, it, it just takes something away from it. You see, and you hit the lights there and it hits it. And I think it's not, I mean, you can win. Um, there's one photographer, I won't name him. Um, it's got a course. I was, um, I, I, I always, because uh, I love photography. So I always try and do as many of these so get a bit of an understanding of each photographer's mindset and you know his mindset was if you change it that you've got a possibility of winning competitions and if that is one th if that is what you want to do uh, fair enough you know you can't stop someone but i think it takes something away from the actual you know, you know photos itself there's a lot of photos the same kind of type time and time again they kind of got that washed out uh whitish background they've kind of it, with you know the back the person with a back to them with sometimes they got the hand holding out the back or that's not really what i want to kind of do you know so um but i'm not an expert at taking photos and if you want to do that that's fine it's like everyone's very it's very popular to do that kind of style but for me it's not really that's not what i kind of want to do they, i think they have a saying with photography that you you take photo once um you don't take it right first time like yeah you shouldn't try to if you've got to do lots of post-production to it it means you you've not you've not done your yeah, job that's, that, that's what i was taught in school so when you take it i remember my school teacher saying when you take it you make sure you get the right shot you know angle and whatever and stuff and if you're having to rely as you're just saying there post-production it's not it's not ideal, is it? So I think it's it's become a lot easier now to, to become, I guess, for everyone has become photographers, I guess. But I, mean, I guess I look at myself as an old school, you know, learned the craft growing up. And um, but I think it does. Obviously, I understand um, technology has moved it along. And, you know, I'm not saying that it's, it's a bad thing, but I, I don't know whether the art of taking, you know, photos is sort of lost in in some respects a bit like uh, social media has sort of the art of traveling has sort of you know become lots of selfies and going to places and not really wanting to learn about anything you see but not everyone does that but um yeah it's just one of those
things that we have to get used to it, don't we? So thank you for coming on. No uh, problem. Your time. Uh, I know you're quarantining at the minute because you've just come back from Bulgaria as well. Uh, by the way, how was Bulgaria, by the way, before I let you go? Yeah, it's fine. There's absolutely... We've been there quite a few times because um, Ellie misses playing ticket away. She comes from Bulgaria, so um, she, she's got family out there. So we went and saw some of her family went for her grandmother's 80th birthday, in fact. Um, so we've been a few times. We mainly stick to Varna and uh, Borgas. Um, but yeah, it, it's lovely weather out there still. They've still got brilliant sunshine. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope to see you hope to see you face to face one day so yeah uh, maybe we'll go for a pint or uh, have a coffee or something thank you very much i uh, appreciate it if you would like to connect with david and perhaps be interested in purchasing some of his photos you can find him on instagram and twitter on the handle plane ticket away that's it for taking one of his shabs hope to see you all very soon until next time bye for now <laughs>